Welcome to numerical methods. So this is my definition now of the Monte Carlo approximation. So I have a sequence of IID random variables XI. We define here this running average, one divided by N, I from one to N sum of XI. And the claim is that this somehow converges to the expectation of the XIs. Yeah? All XIs have the same expectation, the expectation of maybe an underlying random variable X for which we have generated this model of IID random variables XI. Yeah, so let's discuss the Monte Carlo convergence results. So the first thing which we maybe recall is the strong law of large numbers. So let x1, x2, x3, and so on, be IID integrable real valued random variables on the same probability space. So they all have here the same expectation mu. And now the claim is that the limit of my Monte Carlo approximation is equal to mu. Well, this guy here is a random variable. So this expression that this should be equal to mu, actually I have to evaluate it on different omegas. Yeah? So the claim is that the set on which this holds has probability one. So this holds with probability one. Okay, so there's a drawback that this holds only in probability. Yeah? So there could be a single event omega with probability zero, yeah, where it does not hold. So there could be a null set where it does not hold. But maybe the biggest drawback is that I have here this limit n to infinity. Because I would like to use this method to approximate the expectation. So I would like to use some n, maybe n is large, yeah? n is 1 million sample points or something, n is large. But I would like to approximate it with a finite n. And here I only have a result in the limit. But at least we know that this thing converges to the mu. So there are generalizations of this result, uh, ergodic theorems. So ergodic theory is actually about looking what is happening to the time average and the space average. So this thing we were looking at is actually the time average. If you think of these XI being at different times, yeah, repeated experiments, and our expectation mu is the space average. It's an integral over all omegas. And the result is that the limit of the time average yeah, is equal to the space average. So do we know at which rate converges our approximation? So at which rate converges our Monte Carlo approximation. So maybe you recall the central limit theorem. So let again x1, x2, x3 be IID revalued random variables on the same probability space. So we have mu is the expectation of the xi. There should be square integrable. So I have also here sigma squared, the variance. And then we have the result that in the limit n to infinity, again, I don't like it. I know that the probability of my Monte Carlo sum 
you know, or let's say the probability of one divided by square root of n times sigma multiplied with the sum i from one to n xi minus mu, the probability that this expression lies between a and b is phi of b minus phi of a, where the phi is the cumulative normal distribution. Okay, this looks a little bit strange, but you can easily rewrite this set here inside. So this is the set of omegas where this holds. Yeah? So of course it is the same set if I just multiply with one divided by square root of n. So I have a divided by square root of n. And then I multiply with sigma. Okay, then I have multiplied with one divided by square root of n multiplied with sigma, so I have a one divided by n here in front. Huh? So one divided by n, sum i from n, from one to n, xi. So averaging the mu is just the mu, yeah, so I can leave away the bracket. Yeah, it's actually the bracket now around here. And of course, uh, the transformation also on the b, yeah, so I have divided by square root of n and multiplied with sigma. So now you see that we have a nice expression here. The difference between my Monte Carlo approximation and my true expectation, yeah, this lies with a certain probability in an interval between A times sigma divided by N and B times sigma divided by n. So in an interval, and this interval is becoming smaller and smaller. Yeah? You would choose maybe a to minus five, b to plus five, yeah? so five standard deviation below, five standard deviation above, yeah? maybe something like that. And um, the interval is becoming smaller and smaller. Yeah? So my error bound is becoming smaller and smaller. So if you choose um, b to be equal to minus a, yeah, then you can take an absolute value here and you have some, some kind of error bound. So we already see from this here that it looks a little bit as if we have convergence with a convergence rate which is, which is one divided by square root of n. Unfortunately, we have the same two defects. This result holds only in probability. We don't get this removed for quite a while. Yeah? This will take a time. But bigger problem, this only holds in the limit. Yeah? So really, I do not know if I'm already in this interval. It really holds only in the limit. So again, Again, not suitable for us because I would like to use it with a finite n. This is just the calculation which I just did, yeah, so that you can rewrite this in this form here, which looks a little bit nicer, yeah. So you see that you have some kind of uh, O of 1 divided by square root of n conversions. The thing that we have here, this limit, this can be fixed now if we look at the Chebyshev inequality. So recall the Chebyshev inequality. So what was that? So let x be a square integrable random variable. So mu should be the expectation of x. And the variance of x should also exist. Well, sometimes I write sigma squared. Then we have that the probability that x deviates from its expectation by more than epsilon is less or equal the variance of x divided by epsilon squared. Okay, first let's check the proof. I have the proof here only for uh, an absolute continuous random variable 
so where we have a density phi. So we start on the left-hand side with the variance of x. So this is just a real valued random variable with a density. So I can write this as the integral x minus mu squared multiplied with phi of x. So now if I take out um, of my integration domain, so my integration domain is here the whole interval. If I take out some area around the expectation, so I only integrate over the set where x deviates from the expectation by more than epsilon, then I make the integral smaller. Yeah? I make the integral smaller because this stuff here is data equals zero. Yeah? So I'm cutting out a part from this integral. So I make the integral smaller. But if I do know that x minus mu is larger or equal epsilon, then I make it even more smaller if I replace this part here x minus mu squared by the epsilon squared. So I make it even more sm smaller if I take the epsilon. Okay, and then you see that you can move the epsilon in front and this is just epsilon multiplied with, epsilon squared, sorry, multiplied with the probability that I'm outside these intervals that x deviates from mu by more than epsilon. Okay, so now you divide by the epsilon squared and you have that this probability is less or equal the variance of x divided by epsilon squared. Yeah, you can generalize Chapichev inequality to LQ. Okay, but don't need this. So how can the Chapichev inequality now give us an error estimate for our Monte Carlo approximation. Well, we just use this with the random variable x being my Monte Carlo approximation for a fixed n. So first thing you observe is that the expectation of this x is one divided by n, the sum of the expectations of xi. Yeah? So this is just my mu. Okay, so this guy will be just my mu. And the variance of x is the variance of one divided by n sum of these xi's. So the variance yeah, is expectation x squared, my, x minus mu squared. Yeah? So I can move the one divided by n in front as a one divided by n squared. So this is quadratic. So this is the variance of the sum. And now we have that the xi's are independent. So if the xi's are independent, the variance of a sum of independent random variables is the sum of the variances. So this is my sigma squared. Okay, this is my IID sequence. Yeah, they all have the same variance. This is sigma squared. So this is one divided by n squared, n times sigma squared. So this is sigma squared divided by n. So this is now our Monte Carlo convergence rate. Let xi be iid real valued random variables on the same probability space. Mu is my expectation. 
sigma squared is the variance of these guys. And then we have just proven that for any epsilon larger than zero and any n, the probability that my Monte Carlo approximation deviates from the expectation by more than some epsilon, this is less or equal the variance. So the variance was sigma squared divided by n. Yeah. So the sigma squared, the sigma squared divided by n hmm, divided by epsilon squared. Well, this form is maybe not what we what we like. Yeah, um, actually, it is larger than epsilon. Uh, you can transform this to the opposite. Uh, yeah, event. Yeah, okay. So let's 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 apply p of a is one minus p of not a. Okay. Um, so this is then applying a one minus the value. Yeah, so this will then flip here this and we get a we get a one minus on the right hand side. And here we get the event, the probability that we are less than a given constant. And then in addition, let's replace the epsilon by sigma divided by square root of some delta times square root of n. So if you do that, then you get here, instead of the epsilon, this expression. But on the right-hand side, you now get sigma squared divided by epsilon squared. So the sigma squared cancels divided by epsilon squared will give me delta. And here, um, uh, the one divided by square root of n will be, become a one divided by n, which cancels this n, yeah? So I just get a one minus delta. So this guy becomes a delta if we plug plug in this expression. So what do we have now? So now I can prescribe a given probability level, say delta, say 0 0.1. Yeah. Then I know that the probability that we stay within a certain bound is larger than 1 minus 0 0.1, 90%, yeah? 1 minus delta. And now have again a look at this bound. So the um, the bound is of the type sigma divided by square root of delta. Okay, this is a constant related to a property of the x and a property of the probability level we would like to achieve. And then I have a one divided by square root of n. So I have now, an error estimate, I have now a convergence rate, and you see there is no limit n goes to infinity involved here. Yeah, so this holds for a fixed n, but I only have this result in probability. So the proof, yeah, we did the proof by hand, yeah, and uh, note that in contrast to a classical convergence estimate, we have this little defect that our convergence rate holds only with, with a specific probability. So that was it for the convergence result. So now we know convergence and we even know the convergence rate. It's one divided by square root of n. If you go back here to our little 
movie, if you would now draw multiple such lines, each, each line is a sequence, is a drawing, yeah, then actually you would see that these guys approach or come closer as one divided by square root of n. So you, you have a corridor still where you have deviation with a certain, with a certain uh, probability. Next thing is that we will use this method to calculate integrals. This is called Monte Carlo integration. Actually a very simple step. The thing is that if you have a function and a sequence of IID random variables, then the function of this sequence is also IID. So what we do is we take a sequence of uniform IIDs and apply this function and this is just calculating an integral. The integral of f over the domain from 0 to 1 is the expectation of f of x, where x is uniform, uh, on 0, 1. So approximating an integral is like approximating this expectation. So I can use the Monte Carlo method to calculate integrals numerically. That was it.